Some people are claiming that the emissions of EVs are worse than that of ICE cars. They say that the emissions from manufacturing are so high that any benefit is lost. Let's talk through that today. For anyone who's been following along for a while, you might recognise this subject, as it's one we've discussed before on this channel. However, there have been some advances in our understanding of the topic, so a revisit is worthy of a few minutes of our time. I'll put a link to the original video on the end screen of this one, and in the description. I think that earlier video is still worth a watch if you haven't seen it. That covers the story of how the concerns became somewhat more mainstream, why people say what they say in the comments. But let's get back to today's topic and look again at the accusation I see in the comments of a couple of my recent videos. Vandermanian says, what was it Volvo said in a recent press release? Oh yes, and I quote, Volvo produces three versions of its 40 series cars. The XC40 powered by a gasoline engine, the XC40 recharge powered by a battery pack, and the C40 recharge, a more aerodynamically styled version of the XC40 recharge. All three are built in the same factory by the same workers using similar parts. That allows Volvo to do a close analysis of the emissions characteristics of each. On page 24 of its study, there is one sentence that has proof that electric cars are not nearly as green as people think they are. Here is what it says. When also including the lithium-ion battery modules and Volvo manufacturing, the greenhouse gas emissions are nearly 70% higher for the C40 recharge compared with the XC40 ICE. Well, that's pretty damning evidence then, isn't it? EVs are clearly a terrible idea. We don't want more CO2 emissions after all, we want fewer. So let's forget the whole thing. But to quote Mark Twain, lies, damn lies and statistics. The Volvo assessment isn't all that new or recent. And the quotation is talking about only one thing, production. If you've watched my other video, this data won't have come as much of a surprise as it was the original version of this Volvo data that Polestar used in their life cycle assessment of the Polestar 2. This is the latest edition of that data, but it's largely the same assessment. I've linked to this latest version of the Volvo life cycle assessment in the description if you'd like to look at it for yourself. If we look at page 23, not page 24, it says the following. All in all, the carbon footprint of the materials production and refining category, including the lithium ion battery, increases by 70%. So to paraphrase, it's saying that we generate more CO2 building an electric car than an ICE car, about 70% more. But the remainder of the paragraph, and the very next sentence, says this. This increase is smaller than the decrease found in the use phase for all three electricity mixes. So we didn't have to look far to find that the carbon footprint of the electric model is less over its lifetime when including usage because the emissions from an ICE car are significant during its usage. You'll notice that the assessment mentions three electricity mixes. The carbon emissions of an ICE car are fairly constant across the world but the emissions from an EV are significantly impacted by the source of electricity used to charge them. So the assessment compares three separate mixes. The global average. The average across the whole of Europe, what was called the EU28 mix. And thirdly, the theoretical use of solely wind power, which is the very cleanest of the renewable energies. So on the global energy mix, the dirtiest of the three mixes suggested, the electric car produces less CO2 in its lifetime than the ICE car, even when we add up everything, production, usage, and end of life handling. The average EU mix is then better still. Using that mix reduces CO2 emissions by 10 tonnes over that on the global electricity mix. That's about an 18% additional reduction. And then 
Using wind as the power source, the CO2 emissions drop by another 17.5 tonnes, so that emissions during the usage phase of the car become as little as 0.4 tonnes, 400 kilograms, which means the car has emissions less than half of the ICE car in their lifetime. So that's a pretty good improvement, but it's not zero. There is still CO2 emitted through the use of an electric car, especially from manufacturing. It's worth pointing out a couple of imperfections in the Volvo assessment. Firstly, the calculation of primary energy use for the ICE car looks a little low. Primary energy is a measure of the raw energy input for making the car go at the end of the process. It includes energy that is lost in the creation and delivery of the fuel it uses. Those losses are important because they add to the CO2 emissions of the ICE car. If they have that bit wrong, then the CO2 emissions of the ICE car will be higher and the EV is better than it might currently appear. Secondly, the electricity mixes are simplified. They assume that the CO2 emissions from electricity generation will remain unchanged over time. In reality, the majority of the world's grids are cleaning up pretty quickly, so ideally we shouldn't be using that simplification in our calculations. So be slightly cautious of the exact figures here. They are probably a bit more in the favour of the EV than the Volvo assessment suggests. But it's certainly clear that EVs are not completely zero emission for their entire life cycle. The emissions during production are not ideal, what are they and can we do anything to reduce them? There are probably two main sources for the production emissions, mining and refinement. At the moment, the mining of raw materials, pretty much all raw materials, is done using machinery powered by fossil fuels. That doesn't have to remain the case forever though. Indeed, we are seeing a few mining operations trialling electrical machinery. Refinement is also likely to be powered by fossil fuels at the moment. Quite a lot of that can also be electrified quite easily. Some types of raw material refinement generate CO2 as a byproduct of the very chemical reactions used. And that's true of steel making, for example, which uses the carbon in coal to reduce iron. In other words, to remove the oxygen from it. But there do not seem to be any processes like that associated with lithium-ion battery production. Therefore, we should be able to reduce the carbon emissions of the production of lithium-ion batteries eventually. But we might need a catalyst to make that happen. The good news is that this very catalyst is now on the horizon. You may remember I mentioned a new piece of EU legislation in a previous video. This legislation has been nicknamed the Battery Regulations because their real name doesn't easily roll off the tongue, but it is linked to in the description if you want to look at it. In that earlier video I was making the point that batteries over 2 kilograms, including EV batteries, will be required to have an online passport, and that passport will contain a wealth of information. As well as detailing all of the contents of the battery, the materials and their origins, there is an extra set of information required, which is the carbon footprint of the battery. Point 12 of the introduction details the intent of the new regulations and reads as follows. This regulation should prevent and reduce adverse impacts of batteries on the environment and ensure a safe and sustainable battery value chain for all batteries, taking into account, for instance, the carbon footprint of battery manufacturing, ethical sourcing of raw materials and security of supply, and facilitating reuse, repurposing and recycling. This legislation looks pretty comprehensive and addresses a number of concerns regarding the use and disposal of batteries, including, but not limited to, those used in EVs but the fact that every battery will detail its carbon footprint has to be commended. Under this legislation, manufacturers will be obliged to make the carbon footprint of their batteries easily visible, making them accountable for the emissions that their suppliers generate, and surely there is no better way to encourage reduction of those emissions over time. There's nothing like a bit of market competition to drive improvement, 
Just as we have seen with safety over the past few decades, once something is measured, it is likely to be used as a differentiator in the marketing literature. The marketing teams will be keen to be a bit better than their competitors, as it's another thing they can use to capture the attention of buyers. And in the car industry, where there is so much money changing hands, that has to have an impact. There are a couple more steps to get this legislation completed, as each member country needs to pass acts to implement the provisions of the regulations. That makes the wording of the timescales a bit complex at the moment. However, the goal is to have labelling of EV batteries from February 2025 and other batteries from August 2026, and for the battery passport to be available online by February 2027. The EU countries each have about nine months to enforce the remainder of the necessary acts if the 2026 dates are to be achieved. But the wording is such that it starts 18 months from enforcement if they miss those deadlines. So we don't have definitive dates as such, but we do know that the EU is very keen to get this in place. So let's hope the red tape doesn't delay it and that manufacturers start the process even before it's necessary for each individual country. Once labelling has started, we will have lots more data to scrutinise and get even better insights into the real world carbon emissions of EVs. This legislation only covers the EU, and because of Brexit, it doesn't directly affect the UK. However, it seems fairly likely that manufacturers will streamline their processes and avoid manufacturing UK-only battery packs that differ significantly from what is needed for delivery into Europe. It's probably too complex to miss off the labelling that is required for cars made for our neighbours. So, despite Brexit, we will hopefully benefit from the work they are doing to hold manufacturers to task, tackling the very sustainability concerns I know some of you have had and expressed in the comments section of many a YouTube video. In summary, EVs already generate less CO2 in their lifetimes than ICE cars, and once the labelling required by the EU is in place, we will be able to see more data to demonstrate that. Furthermore, making the data widely available will put pressure on manufacturers to improve it, encouraging them to get their suppliers to improve in turn. EVs are not perfect, but they are better than ICE cars in a number of regards. And they are the only technology we have that continue to reduce their CO2 emissions throughout their lifetime as our grids continue their decarbonisation process. EVs are not able to solve all of our problems on their own, but when seen as part of the wider energy transition, they are an important step in our march towards a more sustainable future. Thanks very much for joining me. Your questions and comments on this subject are most welcome in the section below. If you've liked the video, then it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And it would also help me achieve my stretch goal for the channel if you would consider subscribing as well. Thanks.